Hello everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Welcome to our online panel discussion dedicated today to the hype of AI and generative AI and retail, where machines mimic, try to mimic human interactions and try to generate uh, creative content. Although I must admit, I've never seen the software or the robot who can understand all the complexities of the weather in Munich where I'm based. Anyway, generative AI technology and AI technology is there for some time. There are already some successful stories in retailers, uh, among retailers and lessons learned. There are also some technological constraints that we have. And today, during on the course of the next one hour, we would love to explore hopefully the most challenging questions that we face speaking to our customers, to our prospects, to uh, different retailers with regards to constraints, business constraints, technological constraints, um, elegant use cases of generative AI application and retail and not only, and um, of course, some of the lessons learned. Help us make this session more useful for you. During this um, webinar, please post your questions and comments in LinkedIn. We will be happy to select the most interesting ones and try to answer them at the end of our panel discussion. And let's begin. Please meet our speakers. Yuri Gubin, Chief Innovation Officer at DataArt, based in New York. Hello, everybody. Denis Baranov, Senior Vice President and Head of Retail um, at DataArt, based in London. Hello. Claudia Fuchs, Enterprise Sales Account Manager from Google, based in Munich. Hello, together. And myself, Olga Romanova, Engagement Manager at DataArt, and as we know, based in Munich. During this virtual event, we can guarantee the authenticity of our speakers. They are not 3D avatars, however, if during this conversation we'll start to speak Chinese, most likely there is a bug and you need to check your language settings. Let's begin. Denis, I know that some of the colleagues of us even refuse to speak about AI and generative AI because it's very wide and vague topics until the exact use case and business value is being discussed. You speak to our customers across the globe. Um, speaking about the last maybe three, four months, or maybe like the first begin the first half of this year. What could be maybe the top popular, the most interesting cases or requests, ideas of the projects that you have discussed? Oh, it's a great question. Uh, obviously, right now, probably the last half a year, or actually probably last year, everyone talked about generative AI because abilities which is bring to the table it's changed um, a lot. Yeah. So we we done machine learning and other things uh, for quite a while, but generative AI changed that in, in approach and provide us possibilities to do things which we did not done previously and uh, which required a lot of efforts. If you are talking about real case scenarios, I think we could divide it into, let's say, a couple of groups. First of all, it's actually still a lot of optimization cases. For example, like extracting data from the PDF, but also use some additional features of generative AI to provide like additional possibilities to search in that data, yeah, and to, to provide that possibilities to, for example, summarize the text. That case was here for quite a while, but right now, again, as, as usual, we could improve it. The secondly, it would not be a surprise, everyone talked about data, and everyone have a lot of data. Right now, you could buy, I don't know, whatever you want. To, I don't know how many things you purchased for the last week or how many things purchased in different regions. All providers could uh, give you that for some price. But to use that data, you could provide a lot of data analytics. So many of our clients want to see what the selling trends, what they will sell in a year, half a year, in a couple of months, how they could dynamically change the price. It's, again, another segment, which we could say like a prediction algorithm starting again from the colors, which would be popular for the next year, and up with the prices, which give you possibilities to sell more. And again, the third part of that request is probably emulation. You, you talked about 3D avatars. Yeah. So again, 
a lot of things which previously could be created just by humans right now could be created by machines. Again, for example, text or avatars or whatever videos. It's a lot of hype around that. Everyone wants to try to create like a free video avatars or create new text with machine generated behind it. So I think that free actually the biggest one. But as always, people try to find the case which will provide the most value because everyone tried generate FI or email everywhere. So clients try to find the real business value cases, I could say something around that. Thank you very much. Claudia, if, it would also be very interesting to learn Google perspective as there are already some success mm -hmm. stories uh, together with Google and retail company. Uh, of, of course. So I can, I can just echo what, what Dennis uh, said. So there are already uh, big names um, that succeeded with Google AI technology. Um, for example, um, I could tell you a little bit about Hunkemöller. Uh, Hunkemöller, mm -hmm. um, they needed to gain a significantly more business value from first and third party data through smart analytics and AI. And uh, to achieve this, they, they needed a single scalable data stack that um, would allow them to uh, develop and implement uh, advanced solutions. And um, yeah, by establishing their own data platform on Google Cloud, Hunke Müller uh, gained the ability to uh, develop uh, advanced AI um, and also uh, analytic solutions that are really owned by them. And um, yeah, I have to say that uh, this capability eliminates uh, the need to rely on external solutions, uh, which empower them to tailor solutions that um, yeah, really perfectly um, align with their, um, yeah, with their unique business requirements, long-term and the strategic objectives. So, Thank you very um, much. <laughs> yeah, and, and a, sec a second, a second um, example would be um, a leading German retailer. So, for example, Chibo, um, they they built a forecasting model uh, with Vertex AI, big query, and uh, generated a millions of uh, predictions each day, uh, really to to manage customer demand in a timely and uh, cost effective way. And the interesting um, or really important topic here also was that their uh, their data scientists and engineers really um, saw a big advantage in what Google Cloud was, was offering. And uh, this, this gave them a lot of flexibility. Understood, thank you very much. And I'm really glad that you mentioned some of the names because I mean, like, it looks like in 2023, and again, McKinsey states just the same, everyone was experimenting with generative AI, right? This way or another. We come to the point where it all ended, but Still, Boston, um, Boston Consulting Group states that by 2025, generative AI technology will take like a third of all AI market. Um, I'm not sure if this is an optimism or not, but Dennis, is it also something that you would, uh, that you would see correlation based on your experience and your conversations that you have with the customers? Yeah, as I said already, generative AI right now in the hype level. And you know, then some technology provides so many, let's say, advantages and people start to play with them because, uh, again, generative AI to start that, uh, uh, let's say, growing of the interest because they provide simple features. Yeah, so you could go to chat, ask whatever you want, and get mostly immediate answer. So it's get attention a lot of people and a lot of people start to interest in on that technology. So that simplicity help them to grow interest a lot. Right now, as usual, like enterprise players start to use it more and more because again, it's provide a lot of advantages and it's actually just the next generation of machine learning which we use for quite a while. Again, it's great to see how technology is evolving because I remember my university time then you, I don't know, use some 
neural network for any reason you you just spend a lot of time to create what you expected from them it could take months it's easily to provide different data sets and teach it to reaction on that after that google and other cloud providers introduce possibility to move it into the cloud and do it quicker right now again language models make it to another level and provide possibilities which previously required i don't know education for years and what we that's why we see that interest are growing and that's why we could see a lot of potential into that and again it's based on the cases which already mentioned the things which previously again required for you quite a lot you could get mostly from the box right now uh, simple like a chat simple educational thing summarizing and etc it just uh, uh, the let's say part of that but if you go deeply and you try to create uh, more advanced language models or adjust it because probably you should not create a uh, large model by yourself but again if you educate on the special materials like i don't know books or special type of documents you could get more precise answers and it could be helpful in many different professions for example for me uh, probably one of the key uh, cases how we could use such kind of generative AI solutions and it's different copilots yeah it's not like a completely uh, i don't know reduce humanity uh, interaction but it helps humans to be more efficient yeah instead of google and some of the answer you you could get it mostly immediately instead of creating some basic patterns you could reuse it uh, getting based on copilot features and i think it's one of the powerful but again as all of us know we have a lot of other cases which we already mentioned and probably will mention during that presentation yeah and one actual of the if you will textbook cases right of generative ai um applicability with retailers is different different really wide variety of different chatbots like support customer agents or like uh, some virtual consultants that help you to pick and provide like uh, recommendations this way or now that they all fall into like conversational commerce and um i know and i saw that it stated that such of approaches help to boost um basically the revenue um and help to provide like more personalized experience for the customers um claudia i know that Conversational commerce is also something that Google looks at and sees some potential. Maybe you comment on this one. Where do you see like this potential is coming and how do you see the future of all these chatbots and conversational commerce things in retail? Yeah, of course, of course. So uh, let, let me dive into, into how, how Google is shaping uh, the future of, of shopping um, with its arsenal of um, AI powered conversational tools. So um, of course you all you all know uh, Gen AI um, is and and will changing the game, and uh, conversational uh, commerce is one uh, one of its uh, most exciting uh, applications. Um, for example, um, if we if we see Vertex AI agents, um, this is our no code entry point. Uh, so you can uh, build sophisticated conversational AI agents using really simple prompts no coding is required and uh, this agent um, can understand natural language um, access your product data and of course uh, guide uh, customers through a personalized uh, shopping uh, journey and uh, for those who uh, want want to have more control uh, dialog flow um, is, is more the powerful tool for crafting both um, uh, both uh, uh, Gen AI and, of course, the the real uh, rule-based chatbot. Um, then we have this uh, contact center AI platform, um, and this is uh, our or Google's answer to um, to the contact center uh, modernization. Uh, it combines uh, virtual agents with the with the human agents to really handle um, efficiently. And, and, and boost the, the customer satisfaction, right? Um, even uh, analyzing uh, calls for, for insights. And um, yeah, so, um, so, in, in the, so imagine, so really imagine a chatbot that remembers your past purchase and suggested the item you will love, right? Mm -hmm. And also, um, getting getting question answer 24 7 
uh, without waiting on hold. Uh, and also, um, yeah, chat, chat with an AI to, to check your order status, uh, changing your shipping address, and even um, process a return, right? So really, our investment uh, in conversational AI is, um, is uh, let's say, uh, reshaping how we shop uh -huh. and how we interact uh, with, with the brand. Thank you very much. I assume some new innovative solutions are coming that we need to monitor uh, in the second half. Well, good, good to know. Um, as we mentioned, and you already like touched, um, there are really big diversity of generative AI cases. I know when we sometimes speak to the customer, we can help them to outline like 40, 50, 60 use cases, which are tailored and applicable just for their business, right? But just mm -hmm. to make it, very helpful and hopefully insightful for all of our uh, guests today. What was probably recently the most impressive generative AI implementation, the project that you came across and would love to share? Um, let me maybe uh, start. Yeah, start with you, Claudia. Yeah. So, um, so I need to say that that I really love solutions um, about enhancing the search. Um, so the abandonment of the shopping chart uh, after um, user didn't find something proper proper uh, is is very is a very common uh, project. So believe it or not, however, three out of uh, four of your customer will leave the e-commerce shop if they don't find a proper item, and um, that's that's mainly the reason uh, why um, Google has introduced uh, search search for retail. And um, to, to imagine that, um, imagine a search engine that understands exactly, really exactly what you are looking for, even if you don't describe it perfectly. Um, that, is, um, that is retail search. And why I love it is uh, really um, because customers uh, really find what they want uh, quickly. And this, of course, uh, leads to more sales. It's, of course, a win-win situation, right? Um, mm -hmm. then, then the um, really personalized shopping. Uh, imagine getting recommendation based on your style, uh, on your budget, on your past uh, purchases. Uh, that, is, that is really what, what retail search can, can do. And um, I need to say what me happens uh, a lot is uh, where visual search uh, um, helps me is um, Ever seen something you love, but you don't know what it's called, right? If you go over the street and you think, oh, that's really nice, but I, I don't know how to, how to call it. Um, and that is where you can easily uh, snap a photo with a mobile um, and uh, retail search will find uh, a similar product uh, in, in, in the store. And, and you may have seen it also, um, the possibility from your private, li uh, private life, uh, if you think about uh, Google Lens, it is a, a similar technology mm -hmm. there. Definitely love it. And I think I saw maybe some of the demos or some of the solutions which are similar to what you described, but just to make, to treat it with a grain of salt. Um, of course, like there are lots of the cool ideas that we can implement, but is there any like, I don't know, metrics, rise and performance success stories that you can share that, yes, indeed, this, this is not also a beautiful idea, but it, in fact, it works, it helps in business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course we have we have of course a lot um, a lot of success stories already. Um, let me think about a few. So, which came to my mind is, uh, for example, uh, Macy's, Benetton, and I believe also a really good example is Snagdati. Um, that is a is a retailer. Um, they enabled uh, the search to integrate the uh, semantic, contextual, and visual aspects of, of searching on their website. And if I com remember correctly, um, uh, they were able to, uh, to really increase their revenue per search visits um, over plus uh, 3%, which, is, which uh, is, is really amazing. Indeed. Thank you very much for sharing. Um, let's go next. Um, Yuri, I would probably want to hear your perspective. So what was the most impressive project to use case or so, some solution that yeah you saw recently? 
Yeah, so um, there, there was a number of solutions with AI in retail before the Gen AI boom, but nowadays um, I really like the idea of precision retail is by tailoring the responses and recommendations based on my profile on, on the data that is available about me, uh, the history of previous purchases, my preferences, something that could be found in, I don't know, in public information and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, one of the good examples would be, uh, um, uh, we, we built a use the, uh, a prototype, it's a buy me bot essentially. When you are searching not, not for a particular item, but you ask what should I purchase for a gift for an occasion or for, for, um, for my project. So the Gen AI converts the request breaks it down into parts and gives you a plan and suggests you item that you didn't know that were part of that project. I want to build a greenhouse and uh, the engine will transform it into a blueprint. It will also give you recommendations and it will show you tools, elements, components that typically people buy for the greenhouse. So I was not looking for a particular tool i had an idea in mind and this this conversion of an idea into the shopping list and suggesting items this is something that was not out there before the gen ai and i can search like in in, in pure text and in, in in english i can ask questions that are not about the particular product but about ideas and the kpi is there yes it's about revenue it's about customer engagements it's daily active users those who actually work basically visiting your shop and working with the solution that you built and it's measuring um, the pipeline the funnel at different stages that results in new revenue so measuring campaigns comparing them one to another and yeah i think that this is um, this is quite impressive absolutely thank you very much and before we switch to Dennis, I would love to ask our audience if you guys are willing to share some really elegant use cases, some interesting solutions or prototypes that you came across, um, retail specific or maybe generic, which are applicable for many businesses, please do that in comments. And don't forget to post the questions. I see there are some. Thank you very much for them. I will try to address um, and we'll try to address them a little bit uh, later. And now let's hear Dennis and Dennis impressions and maybe some perspectives with regards to yeah most interesting solutions that came across. Yeah, again, I think one of the most interesting solution for me always is it's a prediction because for me it's usually crazy how machine could go under our cabot and find what we want to buy or what we want to sell or something like that because again historically it always was conversation around uh, what machine learning could predict or what could not yeah we, we had a lot of stories then theoretically machine learning could predict crashes of the plane so any other things which happen around and right now, it's more and more stories. Our phones are listening to us like uh, city legends. But it's again because we start to be really good on predictions. Yeah, so we, we could slice and dice our audience. We could, after that, predict what we expect. And for me, it's always the most interesting cases. We've done it a couple of times with the clients with really, really great occurrence to predict what would be in selling trends for next three months or what would be new flavor of your favorite ice cream or something like that. For me, it's always when we get into the such territory and we again crash the dots and could find out what we want to have in a couple of months is before ourselves could think about that. It's always really, really exciting. Tend to agree. Um, and yeah, probably I would love to also speak uh, maybe some of one of the solutions that impressed me not so long ago. And here, unfortunately, I have bias <laughs> because it's one of the solutions that um, not so long ago, um, Data Art, our team introduced, um, and it's mostly could be of interest for fashion retailers. Um, we called it Virtual Stylist. And uh, for me, the reason for this bias is because it's a very personal story. Um, I'm coming from the family of three girls and I was the oldest and, you know, we had some limited uh, choice of clothes and every new item brought us joy typically. I don't know, maybe this is coming from childhood uh, where I like love fashion and dress up. And even now when I try to prepare for some conferences or business meetings, yeah, I'm that crazy person who tries to bug uh, friends over chats to, you know, to pick what, what is best to wear, what, what does it suit and so on. And, one of the ideas was 
imagine that you have your own virtual stylist, your friend who can help you to pick the right outfit for some occasion or maybe for, I don't know, some event or just as Claudia mentioned, based on the reference image when you have like no idea what style is that or who's on this picture. I just want to look like this and maybe try to pick like the from the assortment of the e-commerce store, whatever would uh, work. Um, I think maybe the demo sometimes uh, tries to express and worth like hundreds of words. So let me actually even try how the virtual stylist works. What is it about and what is the magic behind it? Um, so you can see just some default store. Pay no, pay, please pay no attention to that. It can be literally just most of the e-commerce uh, modern platforms because virtual stylist is an easy to integrate utility. Um, here we try to uh, call it. We see uh, stylist me. This is how we call the solution, and yeah, we put AI um, in its name. And there are three ways in terms of how I, as a user of the fashion store, would love to pick my outfit. I have some predefined uh, prompts. This is like the task, the search request that I'm looking for. For instance, business casual for a warm summer day in office. I can type something. Oh, on my own, or I can upload some reference photo when I have no idea. Is it like Boho style, glam rock or whatever? Um, here we have some AI generated content. So basically all the images that you're able to see here are AI generated, just to avoid any um, intellectual property issues. So for instance, let's, um, it's, yeah, it's pretty warm today. And yeah, I'm in office, let's me try to pick some business um, outfit that would be matching from the assortment of this store. Here you may see that, Based on my previous purchases, based on my clothing sizes and all the knowledge that AI and this e-commerce store already have has about me as the consumer, there are some recommendations in terms of the sizes, but of course I can switch them. Um, yeah, here is the girl. She looks pretty arrogant at me. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm always a bit frightened when she looks at me this way. Uh, let me see what it would return me. Uh, for yeah, for dress for dressing up, um, yeah. So so far it looks pretty good, and I can put everything uh, like the full outfit, I believe. Um, yeah, add, add to cart. Let me maybe try a different story. When I'll try to um, maybe clear this selection here and try to upload some reference image uh, real quick. So this time it will be something completely different. Uh, let's upload some boho style, um, you know, that, or just a fancy girl in some long maxi dress, summer style. Let's see what it would return for us if I'm looking for some reference outfit. Okay, good. Yeah, I think it coped with the task. So that's the way in terms of how I can dress up and not, not to spend hours browsing the internet and different e-commerce shops trying to see what actually would match these items or another items, or if I need to look for some specific, I don't know, uh, leather, brand, uh, leather belt or whatever. Um, however, when we were just trying to introduce virtual stylist, one of the ideas was to have uh, like the 3D visualizer afterwards. Like, you know, if you imagine 3D virtual try on and for instance, to upload my own photo and see how all these items will match my body shape and all my appearance, how it will look finally on me. But one of the constraints that we ran into that time was that when I try to generate it precisely based on just a few images that I upload, the quality is, to be honest, is not that great. So, I mean, it's not me who's finally being like displayed on these images. And to be honest, sometimes it was pretty ugly. <laughs> That's why we just get rid of this idea. I know that this type of visualization sometimes feel a technical challenge for generated AI technology. Uh, but Yuri, it's not the only one, as far as I'm aware. Maybe you can talk a little bit more. What is the current technological constraints of the state of the art of generated AI? Yeah, of course. And I can touch base on what you just mentioned. So uh, technically, it is possible to generate uh, perfect images and videos and holograms. And you can, it is going there. It is just, just a matter of time. And the, uh, the, uh, the models there are evolving very quickly. So it's just a matter of um, getting the right model. And you know what? Um, the state of the technology with Gen AI right now is you can, I would 
call it this way, you can endlessly watch the fire burning, the waterfall, and latest generations of LLMs competing with each other on all sorts of metrics and generating ever like, the best answers possible. So there is there are no questions about the technological possibility. The constraints are with technology on the other side on how you integrate them, how you build products on top of them, and take into consideration the data maturity, data availability, the quality of the data that you have. Also think about uh, the cybersecurity aspects. This is crucial. Uh, it's how you protect data of your consumers. How do mm -hmm. you generate data that is safe, reliable, ethically correct, that it is within the corporate values and has no biases in it. All of that as, as a complex topic. And there are other constraints. So outside of the orchestration and how to build the product with Gen AI in it, um, think about something that um, it, it's not that obvious, but it is very relevant to the Gen AI issues. It's around intellectual property protection, um, using someone else's content, generating content that may or may not be used by someone else. Let's say you're generating images. Do you want to protect that as your core asset so nobody else will be reusing or generating or training their models on the stuff that you have generated? And another thing that is very relevant nowadays is that you have something that you're selling, a product. You, you can describe their qualities and characteristics and use cases around them. How you intersect the structured data with non-structured and um, fluid requests from consumers, how you connect these two worlds, how do you make the most use of it? What will be, will it be relevant? Will you understand what product will be the best fit to the, will be the best answers? So this is another challenge, but again, I have no doubt with LLMs and foundational models that they're evolving so quickly that images, videos will be better and holograms will be better and the text will be perfect. It is the question on the other side of how you, productize it. Thank you very much. And in fact, yeah, I think like the mentioned that we, uh, the names that we mentioned during this webinar were pretty enterprise one, right? So, and generative AI is still like experimental technology. I don't want to jump to conclusions, but it may sound that generative AI and you can be successful with generative AI only if you have like enterprise level, I don't know, maybe culture, maybe team, maybe expertise, whatever, right? This way or another, I know like there is this set statistics that only one from 10 prototypes or some endeavors in terms of playing around with generative AI actually cross the enterprise production line. And I can hardly believe that this is happening just because the technological constraints. Could it be 3D generation of the images or any other stories that you here mentioned? Um, what is actually like, what, what are the reasons in terms of like these pretty big percentage of uh, prototypes and tries not moving anywhere. Yeah, I can tell that um, these challenges are outside of technology, as I just mentioned. And think about a bigger picture. There should be a strategy, there should be a roadmap and the vision, because there, we can create these POCs very quickly in a matter of days and a couple of weeks, and you will have and another proof of concept, you will have another demo, you will have another idea implemented already. It is the question of how to make use of it and how to validate that it actually generates value, whether it's new value or whether it's optimization of something and saving money. So the challenge that we see is the overall organizational maturity and do we have enough data? What about the overall AI strategy and governance? Do we know how to manage this new technology? How, how do we manage the risk? What about compliance and regulation? What about our cybersecurity and IT infrastructure? Are we ready? Do we have the right technology platform that will support our development? And it should not be treated as, oh yeah, we will implement the chatbot and that's it. No, it's a technology that can be pivotal in your business, in the way how you work with consumers but you need to have a strategy. You need to have resources, people, partner, who will help you get there quickly, and who will help you learn uh, with, with you know, mitigating risks along the way. And I know, Denise, like in our previous conversations, you also mentioned, like, actually, I think 
it's a bit of by design, if you will, right? Like that not all uh, generative AI prototypes are supposed to be successful. Maybe you can just bring this um, pretty new SME perspective to uh, our audience. I don't think it's pretty new, yeah. So because you're you're right, proof of concept. It's proof of concept, and it it could work. It could not work. It's again by design. You do not expect all of your concept will work or worked as you expected. And as always in such experiments, we have to put KPIs. And I could just echo what Yuri is saying at the start of any research and development project, and all. Uh, machine learning still research and development you should understood what is your like red lines where you should stop to experiment and then say yes so that concept doesn't work and it could not work not because of technology you probably could have not enough data or you interpret your data somehow wrongly etc etc i could give you just a good example how technology involved right now a mm, couple of years ago we worked with one of our clients large digital marketplace and they ask us to produce explanation or description uh, of some goods based on photo yeah so and it was pretty significant task for that time yeah so we experiment a lot and we could not provide a good uh, description right now with generative ai we just solved it for two customers just recently and spent i don't know just a couple of weeks to get some initial results and right now it could go from poc to next level and again it's because of technology changes and etc so it's many factors which involved into such a rnd project could just ask you to stop you have to stop sometimes and exactly like there are two like so many angles, right, that you have to look into in terms of prioritization, bigger picture, like the strategy approach that uh, Yuri mentioned. Um, I mean, like it's it could be like to be castle for a retail company to think about, right? I mean, there should be really strong benefits, some advantage why I should actually move forward with some generative AI solution. At least this is like sound to me. Um, I don't know, Yuri, maybe you have like uh, some comments on this one. Yeah. So. Um with with a good understanding of what Gen AI can do, what we observe is we start with a workshop, with the assessment, with trying to outline the the use cases, and we talk to different departments with our clients, um, from sales and marketing to the back office and, and everything is everything in between. So let's say we identify 50, 60 different use cases. So now is the challenge not on the tech side, it's on the product development side. It's again, it's we're connecting it to the bigger picture and the strategy. We try to uh, you know, measure and score each use case in terms of the cost, the return, the risk, um, and how well it fits the strategy of the company. What is important, what is not, resources are not infinite and time is very limited. So after identifying uh, a short list of these use cases. The next uh, best practice is what I call uh, fail fast. Basically, your prototype should be very nimble and quick. You don't want to wait six months to get something out. You want to spend a week and see the results. And if it doesn't work, if you don't like, if you see additional risks, give it a try with some um, customers, work with it internally, receive individuals' feedback. If it doesn't work, look at some other use case because if you can you know there is a risk for a reason of these pocs because consumers it should generate value and if the value is not there try something else and as long as you are experimenting evolving and learning from this experience you are moving somewhere which is crucial here absolutely and speaking about risks um i really want to ask the question and Thank you very much for posting it in one of the comments. Um, on the data front, do you have solutions for how to create individual profiles per consumer that can be used as input for retail generative AI solution that protects the privacy of the consumer? I would probably even ask it a little bit wider, right? So there is a, an anecdote, right? Why don't AI ever tell stories? Because they are afraid of data leaks. So data privacy and proper data privacy and compliance is definitely one of the concerns and the risks, if you will, right now um, for generative AI. Dennis, 
is there any like working ways, some tips in terms of how to address it and make it properly with all the respect of the user's data? No, I think it's a, it's a great question because when we are talking about such technologies, uh, we are really start to be worried about what we put here from the user perspective. GDPRs and all others, it's still here. And then we put, I don't know, some names into the educational model, we probably have no chance to delete that historically. And again, uh, we, we have such conversation previously when we talked about blockchain, could we put something to the blockchain which we want to delete it right now? Can we use like a user data to educate our large models or to educate actually any models? And the answer to that, uh, it's not clear enough yet because, uh, for example, many governments, US government, UK government, some European committees have uh, different departments who are working on that problem together with large enterprise players to be 100 percent sure yes so information would be easily i don't know deletable or something like that but also we saw from the press a lot of conversations and for example i remember some newspapers start to sue some uh, language models because they start they say they use it as education uh, the golden rule always uh, try to use anonymized data. Yeah, so because of course, when you have like all parameters, for example, as an individual, you do not really worry about my name. Yeah, so you don't want to know I'm Dennis Brown. If you want to know I'm a man, uh, my my age, or any others, and you could put it into the categories again. The generative AI, we of course could do real personalization, which not just put in, into the categories, but provide a more, let's say, direct uh, consumer prediction for me, which is quite popular right now. But still, you could use a lot of data anonymously. Absolutely. Um, I know, Claudia, that Google sometimes um, has to deal with like risks and all the conversation in terms of do you use our private user data to train your LLM models? How we as the users, as the consumers, yeah, I know the answer, but it would be great to hear. <laughs> um, I mean, how end users, how the consumers of Google's IPIs, LLMs can be sure that, yeah, their data is actually safe and, yeah, it's not used for trainings? Of course, uh, we, are, we, we do not, right? So, um, so uh, if we think about the data uh, privacy, so our generative support on Vertex AI and, and the Gen App uh, Builder provides uh, the same security controls as, as many um, other of our GCP uh, products, such as uh, BigQuery. And, and the customer data is always, uh, is always encrypted. Yeah, so... Um, so the the access of 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 the customer data um, by by Googlers is also uh, traceable uh, via access uh, uh, transparency. So um, to to answer your your question, so of course there's no no um, no training uh, no model uh, trained at all. Thank you very much. And um, dear guests, feel free to uh, use. Um, the remaining time to post any other questions that you have, maybe some of the comments or feedback already, you were very open to that. Let me actually uh, pick another one from the comment feed that I saw. And Yuri, I would probably ask you to try to address it. What about generative AI in regards to product discovery? I think I saw this question, we were talking about the landscape of use cases, just to give maybe a more context. So, for instance, when the user doesn't know what they actually want, but can be led to the product they want, which would require more than just a recommendation system, but more like a path, a navigation, right, uh, for the user to discover what product they are really looking for. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I partially answered that a little bit earlier. So imagine that you have an interface and i can ask all right i need a best business casual outfit for an interview or for a panel discussion like this one and the gen ai the the engine that you are that you uh, you have uh, on your website based on this description alone may or may not ask me a couple of questions but i did not 
ask for a particular product. I was just broadly asking again for the use case, for the purpose of why I am purchasing something. And I don't know what I need to buy. I'm looking for advice. So here comes the magic of gluing together the structured data of the ontology and your data catalog on, on the stuff that you have in stock and how you describe them and what qualities they have. So you connect them with the uh, uh, language, with the generative component of, of LLMs that can translate what I was asking for with what you have in stock. And through vectorization, through retrieval augmented generation, you can produce a number of uh, items that fit, I was asking for business casual. So it will give me the list of items that are corresponding to this request. Although I was not asking for a blue shirt, it will recommend it to me because this is maybe part of the business casual. So and this is the example of how it can help and lead customers to products it will help customers go through the product discovery phase. So, and yes, if if I if I start picking items, I can further elaborate on my preferences, on the use case. Will it be hot or cold outside? Do I need something else? Is there a theme for the event or something like this? And we can find this product discovery path um, empowered by LLMs and GenAI in um, uh, groceries in. For example, you're you're buying something for the dinner, right? And you want to cook something for the family. If we can buy it for the uh, do-it-yourself projects. If if you're looking for lumber, if you're looking for tools, if you want to build another greenhouse or whatnot, uh, in in the outfit purchases too. Again, with the business schedule example that I described. So here is the use case for the Gen AI here. And I think it also falls into like the magic of conversational commerce, right? Because via the dialogue with the virtual um, assistant, right? This is kind of like the way how you can address it, right? With regards to asking the questions, narrowing down, guiding basically um, the uh, potential uh, consumer in terms of what they actually looking for, what is their like need, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, Claudia, maybe back to you. I know that, um, and we all like kind of like witness um, that, AI is becoming more and more democratic. You don't have to hold PhD. You don't have to be an ML scientist anymore to enjoy the beauty of it. I mean, like literally, you don't have even to be a developer right now. You can even try to use LLMs to see how they are applicable to your business, right? But still, to what cases, to what projects, based on your experience, there might be still a need to bring in the partner? Yeah, of course. And, and, uh, yeah, of course we have the no code platform. Uh, we have all the trained models. Uh, we have also the user friendly interface. Um, however, um, I believe there, um, there are mainly three or four points where partners really, really important. So first of all, first of all, you need a strategic, uh, you need, need guidance, uh, in terms of strategic. So really partners help you uh, align your AI goals with, um, with your business strategy uh, and really um, identify the right tools for your specific needs. Um, then second, uh, of course, it's really important for customization. So they, a, a partner uh, can, can really tailor the AI models to, to your unique data workflows and uh, ensuring also the optimal performance, right? Um, then uh, integration. Um, so uh, integration or integrating AI into our existing systems can be, can be a complex, uh, complex thing and, and partner uh, handle this um, seamless and, and saving you, of course, time and, and resources, right? And uh, a really uh, fourth, fourth point uh, from my point of view is really uh, supporting you. Um, AI is really constantly uh, evolving and, and partners can provide you um, ongoing support, uh, training, uh, and of course, uh, updates to ensure uh, your solutions stay ahead of, uh, of, of the curve. Right. And, um, yeah, so to, to embrace the, the AI revolution, um, build your first prototype with Google tools. And of course, in any case, consider, uh, partnering with experts to really scale and optimize your AI solutions. Um, because the future 
of AI is here and it is accessible really for, for everyone. Indeed, thank you very much. And we at DataR, as Google partner, we already have some uh, so-called accelerators or prototypes of the potential solutions, which help not only to speak about like the textbook cases or something on paper, but actually show to you how it may look, um, how it can uh, function. Um, so, dear guests, um, please uh, post your questions, some of your comments. We'll now go to, uh, we'll try to address them. And here you may also see the uh, QR code uh, to request the demo if you're interested in this type of accelerators or solutions to see how they can um, function um, and yeah, to see their work in action. Um, let me now switch to some of the really cool questions and big thanks to our guests for such insightful and really deep questions. One of the first ones which came was actually when we were speaking about um, some personalized uh, recommendations and uh, some personalized, well, based on some knowledge that we already have from the customer. And one of the questions was actually, where is the memory of past purchases stored? Uh, so by design. Um, Dennis, would you love to take this one? Uh, yeah, it, unfortunately I will. Uh, pretty broad in my answer because it's a it's a question where you are saving your data yes yeah? so, and that's probably the more interesting part right now uh, with a google uh, cloud possibilities we could store a lot of data pretty cheap and that's the biggest difference i still remember times then for example saving one gigabyte of the data it was a challenge because you have a limited number of gigabytes which you could uh, store in different, uh, I don't know, on-premise or early cloud solutions. Right now, terabyte, petadata, uh, it's it's really cheap. So we just try to store as much as we can and after that reuse it. So probably, I hope I get that question right. If not, could you please clarify what you want to know and I'm happy to answer offline or whatever. Yeah, thank you very much. We'll definitely follow up on the questions that we are not able to cover. So um, feel free to post them. Yeah. Really encourage you. Um, Olga, I wanted to comment here real quick. So uh, you store, you can store now what Dennis said. Every search request, every data point about me as a customer, the whole story of what I was looking at, what I was selecting, the, uh, if I were selecting different size or different color, different variation of a product, you can save all of that. But for the Gen AI purposes, you also need to think about the, the second half of the equation is to how to make use of that structured data and stream of that data with Gen AI. So we know about vectorization. It, uh, you basically tokenize everything, every, the, your product description, the profiles of users. You've, you represent that data in a vector and you store these vectors too as a separate dimension is separate data structures that didn't have much of use before and when you do the search mechanically what it means it means that you will be looking will, you'll be comparing um, and searching for the uh, vectors in close proximity to your, your request it's very fairly technical but this is what you know crosses the bridge between structured data and unstructured requests because you will be searching for things that are in line aligned based on these vectors and you can store everything in one platform this is the beauty of uh, gcp so i'm sorry for um, for, for jumping in Oh, good. Thank you very much. Um, um, one of the second question, um, yeah, one of the questions, the second one actually was, which are the main challenges for the retail sector? Do you have examples of use cases to solve them with generative AI? Yes, absolutely. I mean, whereas um, there are like more textbooks, um, application areas like sales and marketing, content generation, internal knowledge bases. Um, our team uh, here at Data Art prepared um, a deck with regards to what could be like these potential use cases in terms of genera generative AI applicability for retailers, for um, CPG companies, right? And even based on the roles, for instance, I'm like the head of operations or head of retail or head of e-commerce, what I could actually uh, look into what can be of interest for me. If you want to get like this document, I'll definitely follow up with that. Maybe just leave a plus um, in comments and we'll see uh, your interest. But just to save time, we have just five minutes left. I really love 
the question uh, with regards to the internal procedures and retail specific um, experience. So let me read it through. Um, I'd like to hear more about internal procedures that are not part of the shopper interface, but are more about managing merchandising and operations like inventory management, promotion management, pricing, theft detection, and some others. Um, Dennis, could you maybe try to address this one? Yeah, of course. Unfortunately, we just have uh, five minutes, so probably if I do not open it fully, I'm happy to reiterate it later on. But uh, let's start first of all from the pricing. And custom pricing is quite an interesting and sizable topic, yeah, because right now with current, uh, let's say, possibilities, we could actually adjust pricing to achieve different goals. For example, we're working with some like a marketplaces which could suggest to different retailers what price they should put based on the revenue suggestion, etc. So if you want to sell faster, you could put that price. If you want to sell some volumes during the year, you could put that price. And again, price could be dynamically changes the same as uh, some other businesses doing. Yes, yeah, so if demand are growing, probably you could increase your price because of, I don't know, weather changing. And right now everyone want to buy a little bit more. Or again, if you also could think about like a pricing as a function from different other things, like a cost of your, I don't know, warehouse operation, etc. you could again predict and play with price a lot. It's one of the let's say solution or a key topic which we talked with a lot of customer. Again, merchandising, it's it's another thing. And right now, as I talked previously, some of our customers really interested in how they could predict what they will buy for the next year, how they predict then it's the right time to move from normal shop to boutique, how they do different promotion, etc. And again, uh, AI, machine learning, or recommendation, it all could help your staff to make the right decision. Again, it's what we name data-driven decision again. So we have a data, we analyze it, we provide some analytics around that. It's all this actually could be some part of uh, your staff have to make that decision because experience, for example, merchandiser who have with your brand for ages, could not be easily overrun by model, but model could suggest some uh, weighted decisions and again, to help you to make that decision happens in future. So again, it, it's a lot of things which you could do with that things and you could find some different analogies which you do not find previously again, because you could analyze the massive data and Yuri just mentioned again, we could have so granular data right now, so we could find the trends which previously we could miss just because we have some limits of data which we could use from the space perspective. Yeah, hopefully I answered to that question. Thank you very much. And maybe just to wrap it up, um, yeah, very, very quick um, question. Um, yeah, I think it should be an easy one. Um, I, I hope it should be a quick one. And Claudia, probably this one would go to you. Um, yeah, Google have their own LLM models, but is it a possibility to still be on Google, but deploy some custom, not Google-based model to the Google environment? Yeah, yeah, of course. So that's, that is that is uh, possible. And this is really, um, this is really um, a new, unique possibility from, from, from Google, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I really hope, uh, dear guests, that this panel discussion was useful and insightful for you. At least we tried our best. Um, yeah, I think there was not any Chinese switches, so I think we managed to make it seamlessly without any bugs. I really thank you very much for spending this uh, hour with us and looking forward to meeting you uh, at our next events. If you still have some questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comment section. Feel free to um, message me over LinkedIn or any of our experts. Thank you very much and enjoy um, the rest of the day. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Have a good day. Cheers.